Women Taking the Lead, episode 251. Seize the day today. If I have an idea, can I take action on it today? I'm action oriented. And so that's what I think about. The second is, um, can I do it faster, shorter, um, in a more succinct way? Carpe diem, right? Like uh, one of my favorite quotes, it's two words. And so those are the different ways why that um, that quote is meaningful for me. And usually when I'm talking to people in my mind, it's Carpe diem, can we do it today? Can we start taking action on it today? Hello, my name is Jody Flynn and welcome to Women Taking the Lead, where we are all about creating blasts of inspiration to help you overcome self-doubt so you can lead with confidence, integrity, and a sense of humor. Head over to womentakingthelead.com to join the community and get the resources to support you on your leadership journey. Now, your future awaits, so let's get started. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm here with Kelly Gashu, who's the founder and CEO of Personal Finance Warrior. She empowers women all over the world to claim their financial power inside their business and in their personal life through her online programs and coaching. She also holds live workshops for companies, women's groups, and alumni groups. Kelly has worked in several areas of finance, including portfolio analysis, research, and investment management. She holds an undergraduate degree from Harvard College and an MBA from the Booth School of Business at the University of Chicago. Kelly, it is such a pleasure to have you here with me. And for everyone who is listening, tell us a little bit more about you and your own humble beginnings. Sure. And Jody, thank you so much for inviting me. So Jody, I'd like to start off that uh, when I was just three years old, my mom needed to leave my dad and he froze her out of the bank accounts. And I'm the youngest of four and my family struggled to get back on its feet for the next two years. And when we moved to Boston at that time, it was December and there was snow on the ground and my mom received a knock on the door and it was a man who had a delivery of toys. And she looked at him and she said, I think there's been a mistake. And he said, actually, a neighbor called and said that your family would, um, would, would benefit from a delivery of toys this Christmas. And so we had toys that Christmas. And as we got back on our feet, we really benefited from uh, the generosity of people in the community uh, and, uh, you know, and family friends. And this experience instilled in me the importance of financial education. And so I dedicated my career to learning as much as I could uh, in financial services. And it inspired me to launch my business so that I could empower women to take control of their finances so that they never end up in a situation like my mom. And so um, even though I focused on education and was, and w- went to schools like Harvard and Chicago Booth, it was really this early experience that instilled in me the importance of financial education. Kelly, you've already already got me crying, okay? (laughs) This is not how we typically start off, but you hooked me. Oh my goodness, what a story and and so much to take from it. And I, I love that's how you kicked off your career. I think, you know, our missions in life always tie back to something that really impacted us as children or young adults. And that is a perfect example of why you do what you do. And, you know, those who are listening are just getting to know you, but I've been able to experience you for a little bit longer. And you are all about this. You are all about educating, um, especially um, female entrepreneurs, so that they have like financial freedom um, and can do what they want to do in the world. And how far you've come from those days where, and and God bless, like a community that helped to support your mom and your family. But, you know, I know you now and you are so confident and you are rocking and rolling and life and enjoying yourself and spreading the love. Um, but again, if you could share with us another time, um, more 
in regards to how you were showing up in the world. I call them the uh, our playing small moments when we don't realize how powerful, how capable, how talented we are. And so we hold ourselves back. Kelly, share with us a, a, one of your playing small stories and the lessons you've learned. Sure, Jody, and uh, I'll share that. So I had lived in Shanghai, China for three years, and when I moved back to the U.S., I became a financial advisor. And when I received an offer from my role, I didn't negotiate for it. And uh, so in that situation, I was when I was I, I was doing some research on the role, I was told that you're offered a set salary and there really isn't room for negotiating. And so I accepted the job offer. And three months later, the my female manager sat me down while we were in a meeting and she said, Kelly, I was really surprised that you took the first offer and didn't negotiate. Did you know that you left $10,000 on the table. And Jody, I was grateful that she shared this information with me because I was completely shocked that I thought that there was a set salary and I didn't negotiate. I didn't ask. And um, there is um, Linda Babcock wrote a book, Ask For It. And um, women, uh, women ask 30 percent less <laughs> than men do just in terms of asking. And so this experience uh, solidified in me the importance of negotiating. And I'm now a huge advocate for negotiating, especially for women. And so I incorporated in the training that I do in my courses. I talk about it in my live events. And um, what also happened in that situation is, so Jody, that was my salary um, that actually when you – uh, start in that rule, that salary is for two years and your bonuses are based on it. So first year, I, I didn't get that $10,000. Year two, didn't get that $10,000 and then the additional bonuses. So that situation cost me at least $25,000. And um, what I, and like I said, this experience has made me an advocate for uh, for negotiating, especially for women. And one of my favorite books that I like to recommend is by Mika Brzezinski, Know Your Value. And what I love about that book is she talks about the pitfalls that women often fall into involved in negotiating. So we, often we have here are the four steps that you should follow. And what I love about her story is she shares the uh, mistakes that she made along the way. So I share my story about the mistake that I made that hopefully will plant the seed in women and inspire them. Don't leave money on the table. Ask for it. It could be the difference of thousands of dollars. Mm, that is a powerful story. And I know I've done that in my life. And luckily also, like you had mentors and bosses who were like, hey, um, do you realize like you could be making so much more and rectify the situation for me? Thank God, you know, because that allowed me more financial freedom to pay off debt and then start making investments and all of that. But I, I look back and think the same thing, like, oh, my God, how much money would I have lost over the course of 10 or 20 years? You know, if, if that situation, like I I know I lost money along the way and probably in the, in the thousands of dollars like you, but it got rectified at some point. And I also learned like, okay, you got to ask, you got to speak up, but I, you know, and I don't know if you agree with this. I think part of it is just the way we're raised where we're not, we're told to be givers, you know, and take care of others, not to be asking. And I think sometimes unconsciously little girls get rewarded for obeying and playing along, and sometimes they get critiqued if they're being, um, you know, quote unquote, too needy or, or asking for too much. And so that would have to change as well if we want to see the pay gap close a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I like to refer to the polite eight-year-old little girl that is inside of most of us women. And then I'll also just allude to, um, we have the story Little Red Riding Hood. 
And pro soccer player Abby Wambach, she gave a commencement speech and she used this analogy of little, well, the story of Little Red Riding Hood that when she steps off the path, the big bad wolf scares her and um, in, in to scares her to go back on the path. And so we as little girls are instilled with stories. Um, and so this is changing and it's up to us to uh, create more stories of women stepping up and um, or just little girls stepping up and asking for what they want. Mm -hmm. Stories are powerful. So hearing more stories of women who've asked for what they wanted or were more bold than the average woman will inspire more people to act accordingly, because sometimes we just need that example ahead of us to go, well, she did it. I can do it, too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and this is a great segue because um, one question I ask all my guests, because I'm a believer that there is no one way to lead. Like it had like our leadership style and what we bring to the table has to do with our experience, what we're passionate about, our strengths, our personalities. And it's all a blend and creates for each person their own unique leadership style. So, Kelly, how would you describe your leadership style? Hmm, Jody, that's a great question. And I would first say that I lead with enthusiasm. And so that is one of my, my natural, uh, natural traits, natural, um, abilities is, and when I lead with enthusiasm, it's really talking about my vision and trying to incite excitement, getting people excited about it uh, as I am excited about it. And so this has to do with different projects. If you're working on a team where you may uh, have a project and to get other people uh, excited about it as well and that you have a vision for why you're doing it, the value that it offers, the benefit and to share that with others. And I would also say along with that is listening. And often you, they, you may not think that the two go hand in hand, but they're actually critical that they go hand in hand. So when you're listening, you're listening to the people who are on your team. You're listening for um, what are their thoughts on the project? What is their feedback so that they continue to be excited to work on the project? Uh, since if they, if, you, if as the leader, if I'm not hearing what people around me are saying, then they may lose, you know, they may lose excitement or interest in the project that we're working on. And then I would say the third thing that I think is critical and that is often missing is feedback. I've worked in organizations where feedback was just discouraged, <laughs> where candid feedback was discouraged. Um, you had you had performance reviews and they were polite, um, polite exchanges. Um, it wasn't meaningful feedback where um, what are steps to get to the next level or when you review a project, what um, what worked and what didn't work. And that's something where um, I just have uh, launched a big project. And that's what after the project is complete to have a session what um, what went well, what didn't go well, and on both sides um, for to ask the people on the team, what do they think went well and to be able to give them feedback. And then for me to ask feedback about what their thoughts were about things I could have done better. I think that feedback exchange, if you can create an effective feedback exchange, then the uh, level of the team will rise. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that is often missing. And I think it's not easy to create because I think it takes um, courage, confidence and conviction. Uh, often people don't want to necessarily hear about what they could have done better or could have done differently. And um, like I said, I've seen it in organizations where it hasn't been done as effectively. And so I think the, the feedback piece is really valuable so that we can continue to improve as leaders. And so I would say the, those three things. So enthusiasm to be able to communicate my vision with excitement to energize people to want to um, help me um, uh, help me like, implement my vision. The second is listening um, and really hearing the people on my team um, so that we're all working, you know, working together and cooperating. 
And then the third is feedback um, and that two-way feedback exchange for people on my team. And then they're giving me feedback on how I can improve as a leader. Mm. And taking all of that, what is one thing you're working on right now that you're really excited about and want to share with us? Sure. And this relates to a big project that I've been working on. So I um, I love talking about money and would love encouraging women to talk about money. And I created a research, I created a research project and I interviewed 24 female entrepreneurs around the topic of money called Money Mastery. And I was curious about what money lessons they wish they had learned earlier in their entrepreneurial journey as well as money habits they incorporate uh, as they are scaling their businesses, as they're running multi-six, multi-six-figure, seven-figure businesses. Because often we find out that we learn mistakes the hard way. <laughs> and I would like to see how we can share information and see how we can learn, um, especially lessons around money that we can learn from other people's experience so we can avoid some major pitfalls. And um, I actually ended up writing the five key, the, the five money habits that will help you explode your business. And the five key takeaways from the speakers, um, number one involves your money mindset. Second is organizing your accounts. The third, developing a budget. Uh, the fourth is having a retirement plan as an entrepreneur. Many entrepreneurs don't yet have a retirement plan. They think I'll get to that at some point. And a number of the speakers talk about how important it is. And then number five is to create a long-term financial plan. And that, uh, I'll especially number five, refers back to Abby Wambach, um, the pro soccer player, as um, her commencement speech. I mean, it's really gone viral um, as it has so many key takeaways in it. And one of the points she shares is that she did not claim her financial power as a pro soccer player. She was focused on winning gold medals and winning a World Cup title. Uh, the U.S. women's soccer team is one of the most decorated soccer teams around the world. And she was not focused on obtaining corporate sponsorships and didn't uh, focus on a long-term financial plan. And so she was on the stage with sports legend Peyton Manning in football and Kobe Bryant in basketball and said, the difference among the three of us is I still need to work because she didn't focus on her financial power. And so her story came at really the, um, the, really the the completion of, of of my project and so that really was a great frame for how how important this is really for all women for us to talk about money for us to find ways to claim our financial power and to be able to learn from others especially women um, about what uh, best practices they're doing the money habits they use and then money lessons they wish they would have learned earlier on. So it was really an amazing project. And um, I have details on my website of the interview series for those who are interested. Mm. And what I got from your story about Ali Wambach as well was like realizing your value as well. Like I don't think it occurred to her like that she would be valuable to corporate sponsors, you know, because it wasn't her focus. And I think sometimes – as women in corporate or in our businesses, sometimes we hold ourselves back or we don't go after bigger things because we don't recognize our value to other people. Mm. And often we just may not have somebody, um, we, she may not, not have had an agent advocating here all the ways that you can profit from mm -hmm. your experience as a pro soccer player. Mm -hmm. and, so getting expertise as, or um, expert advice. Uh, yes. And about the and again, about the financial side of things. And we're often um, and this is part of the conversation about about money. 
So often men, they're, they're, they're exchanging information about their salaries, their bonuses, about key projects, and women often aren't having that conversation. So Jody, on my website, I have my top 10 warrior rules. Mm -hmm. And rule number five is to talk about money with, um, I say to talk about the, with the women in your life, to talk about salary and bonuses with the with the women around you and so i think encouraging more conversation about it will um, bring it to top of mind and it goes to your point jody about value it's not necessarily about the dollar amount uh, and it does have an impact on the lifestyle that you lead but it is more important about um the uh, the the options that you have available to you. So for example, with Abby Wambach, that she still needs to work. She doesn't have the flexibility to go be, you know, to fulfill her, um, to fulfill her dreams of maybe um, doing something for a nonprofit or um, for something where she doesn't have to focus on the money side. She has to earn a living and that's, and that's the difference. Mm -hmm. And so I, I say the financial side of things with the idea that it creates more options and flexibility for women. Perfect. And on the flip side of things, Kelly, what would you say is the biggest leadership or business challenge you're faced with right now? And we'll just see if there's an opportunity for coaching. <laughs> so sure, Jody. So one of the challenges that I face now is offloading more work to people on my team. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I am the bottleneck for that. And so maybe there are some other A-type women out there who understand the situation that um, I, I, I've actually had experiences where I have um, given, you know, I have given projects and they, um, there have been challenges with the fulfillment of those projects. Mm -hmm. And so I, that's the task on my hand, on, on my plate is how do I offload more responsibility to the people on my team in an effective way? <laughs> okay. So, and I, you know, how do you, of course you had me giggling as soon as you start, as soon as you said the word, I'm the bottleneck, <laughs> like, I'm like, I know what's going on here, <laughs> but what would you say, um, because we, we've spoken about some of the initiatives you have in your business and you've talked about your team and listening right now. How do you feel? Because you referred to a previous experience, but how do you feel about your current team? Uh, I feel like I'm the bottleneck. Um, I, I feel like um, in terms of skills, so as I... You, we have different team members that you ask them to do um, certain. You ask them to do certain tasks, and then you want to give them additional responsibility. And some may be able to step up to that additional responsibility, and some may not have the skills. Mm -hmm. And so that is something that that I that I believe that I'm encountering. That um, have a couple of team members that may not have the skill set for what I'm looking for to really offload some of the the tasks on my plate. Okay. So when you say that, what but maybe, but Jody, I, I welcome your thoughts. I might, I might, be, I might not be thinking about that the right way. Well, from your perspective, what I'm hearing is, is not so much that you're a bottleneck is that you're looking for a specific skill set. That's not perfectionism that that's, you know, there's a difference between assessing and judging, you know, assessment is black and white. Does this person have the skill? Yes or no or the potential for the skill, yes or no. You know, if they don't have the skill, do they have the potential? If the answer is yes, then it's a matter of um, time, training, resources, et cetera. But if after determining they don't have the skill, nor do they have the potential or the inclination for the skill, and oftentimes people will tell you, you know, like that's not something I'm interested in or that's not something I can do. If that's the case, that's, that's just assessment. You know, they, they are not up for this task. A judgment would be to say, and that makes them a bad employee. Not necessarily. That's a judgment. You know, it's assessment is, can they do it or can they not? Yes or no, black or white, fact, not, you know, all of that. What are the facts? Judgment is something different. And I think sometimes, um, especially as, as type A women, you know, we can run into situations where 
everything's fine, but we're judging it and we're judging ourselves. And from the way you're describing it, it sounds like what it's not that you're the bottleneck. It's that you need to like you're on the hunt for a skill set. So thanks, Judy. And to add to maybe a little bit of a gray area is I think that I, I want a couple of the people to um, to step up and I I want them to have the potential. And as we're working on projects, they may not have the potential. <laughs> And so for those out there who may have this experience on teams and they they have been part of my team. And as I said, as I'm looking for additional skills and if they don't have them, I'm at the point where does that mean that I then need to find someone else for um, for these skills that I need? And what do I do with this current person? So I think that's part of it as yes, well. Yes, because we get attached to people just because we're type A doesn't mean we don't have hearts and we don't feel emotion <laughs> and we don't love people. Right. So here's the thing the same thing happens i really value the people on my team (laughs) you know because this is the thing too it's like it's not just in business like people are people are people like this is in you know in our um relationships as well in our personal life like it's it's you know oftentimes team members can kind of be like a dating relationship too right there are seven out of ten (laughs) <laughs> Can I be happy with that? Because they're a really good person and we get along most of the time. But, you know, it's that three out of 10. How much of a sticking point is that? Right. And sometimes like bring it back to assessment, take it out of judgment. It's not that they're a bad person. They just may not be a fit. And, you know, this isn't decided in one conversation. You know, this is, you know, I'm sure you're having conversations with your, your team around like, you know, what are the skills that you have? What skills would you like to develop? Where do you see yourself going? That sort of thing. But if it's determined that, you know, they're always going to only be a widget worker and you need somebody who takes initiative, then they're not going to be a good fit for the long-term vision of your business. And I know many business owners who... (laughs) It's almost like it's called a charity fund. They keep on team members who are not contributing to the overall success of the business, but they do their their small part. And so they pay them a paycheck because they just can't see to, see to let them go. And if a business has the funds for that and you want to call that like, that's my charity, that's my goodwill, this is how I'm serving humanity, great. I would also question in a situation like that, are you also maybe holding that person back? from finding a job that suits them better, you know, but if it's all working for everybody, great. But I don't know too many businesses who have the funds to be able to keep somebody on to do some widget work when what they really need is additional people to take initiative. Mm, Jody, thank you. And I especially appreciate your, the, the view that uh, am I holding them back? from a role that they might really enjoy. So if I shift my mindset to that rather than, yikes, I might lose this person and what impact will that have? Then actually I could be holding them back from a role that um, they can really benefit from. Yeah, what I find is if somebody doesn't fit the business, they know it, they feel it, you know? And, you know, nobody likes, you know, showing up for a job where they're, they're feeling like, I'm not really contributing or I might be holding, you know, it back, the, you know, the initiative back or anything like that. But that usually comes out in conversation. You have such a big heart, Kelly, and so <laughs> worrying with such big ambitions. And I, I get you. <laughs> I get what that feels like. All right. So now we're going to move on to the quick leadership roundup. So, Kelly, tell us, what is one practice you have that helps to make you a better leader? Well, Jody, in the morning, I go to the gym uh, and that's my meditation. People have their morning practice. I love going to the gym in the morning and I've tried different things. So I like to actually go to a physical gym. I like to be part of a gym class, be around people. And then that helps start my day with a clear mind. What advice would you give your younger self? (laughs) I would tell my younger self to share more of my wild interests and wacky ideas. I think that I was concerned that people would think I was a little nutty. (laughs) 
And some of my ideas, Jody, I moved to Shanghai on my own. Um, I studied Asian studies in college and I wanted to go be on the ground and witness economic development in China. Uh, I decided to launch my own business to empower women to take control of their finances. And I, uh, I, you know, I feel like I um, incubated these ideas and then until they were in, um, that they were a more thought out plan. And my younger self, I would just say, share those ideas, talk to people and share them with more excitement. Now share with us a success quote or a mantra and why it has meaning for you. My favorite quote is carpe diem, seize the day. So I went to a classically oriented high school. I studied Latin for six years and it is, um, so we learned that early on and it is symbolic for me for a number of reasons. First is it's short and quick. So seize the day today. If I have an idea, can I take action on it today? I'm action oriented. And so that's what I think about. The second is, um, can I do it faster, shorter, um, in a more succinct way, carpe diem, right? Like uh, one of my favorite quotes, it's two words. Mm -hmm. And so those are the, um, those are the different ways why that, um, that quote is meaningful for me. And usually when I'm talking to people in my mind, it's carpe diem. Can we do it today? Can we start taking action on it today? I love that. And lastly, Kelly, what is the best way for this community to connect with you? The best way is um, my website is personalfinancewarrior.com. And then on Facebook, I have a private community group and I do my videos. I do videos three times a week and I post articles and then there's interaction among group members. And so I would say that um, feel free to join my personal finance warrior community group. There is great interaction and great energy in that group. And for those of you who are listening, you know you can find all the links and resources shared in this episode at womentakingthelead.com. And Kelly, thank you so much for taking the time to inspire and enlighten us. We are all better for having met you. And Jody, thank you. Thank you all for joining me on Women Taking the Lead. And to strengthen you on your own leadership journey, I'd like to send you off with a quote from Marianne Williamson. So here goes. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Again, thank you for joining me and here's to your success.